All right, we're now ready to start with our next topic, which is function adapters. We've seen a bunch of examples of function adapters already, and I've talked about them as we discussed the examples, but now we're gonna actually cover them comprehensively so you can see how many function adapters there are in STL and what they do. So there's function adapters in STL in order to be able to reduce the total number of functors that you need to write. And you'll see that one of the great things about function adapters is you can take already existing functors and then adapt them in all kinds of creative ways so you don't have to rewrite those functors, but instead can take what's there and just arrange them in interesting ways. So the other thing you can do in addition to not having to create as many functors is you can chain together a bunch of functors in order to be able to do very powerful composition of capabilities. And this is particularly useful for predicates, as we'll see. These functors allow programs to combine, transform, manipulate functors with each other with certain values or with other special functions. And uh, we'll see some really fun examples that, that show off all these capabilities and all their full-blown glory here shortly. It's, it's really fun and really cool. There are three types of STL function adapters. The first type, which we've looked at, but we're gonna look at more systematically now, are the so-called binders. And there are three of them. Two of them are kind of legacy and deprecated, which are bind first and bind second. And then there's a newer variant called bind. And that's preferred, although a lot of people prefer to use lambda functions as opposed to using bind. Then there's also something called negators. And those include things like not one, not two, and not fun or not fn and these take other the output of other functors and then negate them so true becomes false and so on and so forth and then there's also a third category which are the member function or function adapters uh, which are, i should really say member function or pointer to function adapters like pointer fun mem fun and mem function mem fn and these allow functors to be class members. And we'll see some really fun examples with those as well that are quite interesting. Now, uh, we'll start off by talking about binders, and they can be used to transform a binary functor into a unary one by acting as, as a converter between the functor and an algorithm. So just like uh, if, you, if you have a Mac computer, like I do, you're probably having to haul around adapters with you everywhere you go because lots of other things don't work out of the box with Macs. Macs, especially newer Macs, tend to use USB-C connector types for everything, but there's all kinds of stuff out there that wants to have USB-B types or HDMI or so on and so forth. And so as a result, you often have to have an adapter that will let you adapt things. And that's basically the same idea here. So these are the three types of binders. We have bind first, which takes an operation, which is a functor typically, or an adapted functor, and it goes ahead and binds an arg as its first parameter. So it's gonna bind the first parameter. We'll see what it means to bind the first parameter here in a minute. Then there's also something called bind second, which also takes some kind of op, which is typically a functor, or a functor, a composed functor, and it has an arg and it's used to bind its second parameter, so bind first and bind second, specifically designate one or the other of these things. And for various reasons, those have been deprecated and in fact are being removed from newer compilers. So where you're supposed to go if you wanna use this capability in, in newer C++ and you wanna use binders is the bind method. And this is, is a bit kind of crufty and it takes an op, and something called placeholders, which you can designate where you want the placeholder to go. And it also takes an arg, and it calls the op with the arg as whatever parameter you designate from the placeholder point of view. So we're now gonna go ahead and take a look at a bunch of examples of binders. So these are all gonna be binder function adapter examples, and you can find them in the link at the bottom of the page. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start talking about different examples of binders. And I'm gonna demonstrate bind first and bind second, which have been deprecated, but they're still interesting. And if you're using an older compiler, they'll be useful to know and how they work, understand them. And then we'll talk about the newer approach, bind, and we'll compare and contrast 
bind first and bind second and bind. And uh, this should hopefully give you a pretty good feeling for how all these different binders work. So here's bind first. We're gonna make ourselves an array of numbers. And you can see we have seven numbers here in no particular order. And then we're gonna go through here and we're going to iterate through the range of numbers from beginning to end of that array. And we're gonna go ahead and count the number of elements in the array that have 10 as their value. And of course, that should come back with two. Uh, and then we'll print out what we found. Then we're gonna go ahead and do the same thing. Instead of using bind first, we're gonna use bind. And bind is going to go ahead, in this case, do the same thing. It's gonna go ahead and go through the range in the, that array from beginning to end doing an equal to, and wherever it matches the value 10, we're gonna count it. So that should give us back the same result. And then the third thing we're gonna do here, just for kicks, is we're gonna go through the range from beginning to end of that array of numbers. And now we're gonna use a generic lambda function. So we're just gonna say, does, does i equal 10? And, and all three of these things are going to return the same value. <laughs> so that's, that's what, as you'll see when we run it, should be reassuring. We get the same results for each one. And uh, I don't know about you, but I kind of prefer the generic lambda approach here. I think it's most obvious what's going on. And if you, you know, get down to counting the characters, you'll see it takes the smallest amount of characters to type from your writing point of view. So I think that's a good one to use for that. Let's now go ahead and take a look at bind second. In this case, we're going to have the same array. We're going to do bind second, looking for 20s this time, and there'll be two 20s also. And we're going to do the same thing using the bind method instead of using bind second. And then we're going to do the same thing using a lambda function. Once again, these will all return the same results. And uh, uh, we'll go take a look at the, the functors and how they work in just a second. But these are showing all those three different ways of doing things. So just for kicks, let's go ahead and take a look at the implementations of these. So here is the bind second function. As you can see, it takes an operation, which in this case would be equal to, which is itself a functor, and a value. And it goes ahead and it creates a binder second object. And the binder second object is going to stash away the operation, which is a functor. So it has a function call operation and a value. And you can see here that the operator function call for binder second calls the op with the parameter underscore underscore x, which is whatever's coming through from the underlying range that's being iterated over with, you know, count if, find if, whatever. And it's going to go ahead and then pass the value in there. So it stashes the value in the op and then it makes underscore underscore x be the unbound variable that gets bound when the algorithm runs, and that will go ahead and bind the second value. Let's go ahead and take a look at bind. So bind is this newer thing, and as you can see, it goes ahead and uses the forwarding mechanism that's built into newer versions of C++, and it forwards to this function here, um, or it forwards, it calls the function forwards the function with the arguments, and these are the bound args, and it's using the variadic template mechanisms that we've talked about in the past, so it can basically pass those things in to the, the function that's passed in. And you can see that this is more complicated, but it's also very cool, newer, newer fangled STL template magic to do the binding. And you can either bind the first or the second, depending on what you pass here. So in this case, we're Go ahead and doing that, um, and it's getting the behavior that we want. Now let's come down here and let's compare and contrast bind first, bind second, and bind. So now we're really going to get to see the differences between these different operations, and it's it's a little bit confusing about their semantics until you compare them apples to apples, like we're about to do right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and call bind first with the plus operation and the value 10. So we're gonna go ahead and um, basically get ourselves a binder. 
So if you take a look at this, if we were to expand the declaration, we're getting ourselves an instance of binder first. So we're gonna get one of those, we're getting a binder where the first parameter is bound, then we're gonna get another binder where the second parameter is bound, and then we're gonna go ahead and get binders using the bind method as opposed to bind first or bind second. And the first one is gonna bind the first parameter, and the second one's going to bind the second parameter. So in this case, we're gonna bind this as the first parameter, we're gonna bind this as the second parameter, and then we're gonna go ahead and call P1, P2, P3, and P4. So these are all calls to binder objects, and we're gonna pass in the value, and then the operation's gonna be performed. Now what's interesting about this is for all the first uh, four of these, P1 through P4, P stands for plus, it doesn't matter whether we bind the first or the second parameter because addition, of course, is commutative. So A plus B equals B plus A. For the second series of examples here, however, we're gonna go ahead and bind minus as opposed to binding plus. So that's gonna make a difference because of course subtraction is not commutative. So A minus B is not the same thing as B minus A. So now we're gonna get ourselves a bunch of other binders where we're binding the minus operation with the value 10. So we're gonna get M1 through M4, where M stands for minus. And then we're gonna go ahead and call those binders explicitly with the value 20. So what we're gonna do there is we're gonna basically either be subtracting 10 from 20 or 20 from 10. And that will definitely give us different results. So let's go ahead and run all this code and then we'll look at it and this should hopefully make it all much more clear what's going on. First and foremost, as you can see here, the uh, binder first and binder second stuff all gives the same results. There's two elements that are equal to 10 and there's also two elements that are equal to 20. That's probably not a big surprise. Down here though is more interesting. So as you can see here, when you add 20 and 10, it doesn't matter whether you bind the first parameter or the second parameter, you always end up with 30. However, when we come down here and we start talking about binders with minus, which is not commutative, then it matters. So when we do bind first, you can see that we're getting 10 minus 20, which is minus 10. But when we do bind second, we're getting 20 minus 10, which is 10. And then the same thing applies here for uh, these examples where we're doing binding, where we're doing binding first. So 10 is bound, and then there's a placeholder for the second parameter. So it's 10 minus 20, which is minus 10. And down here, we're using bind where we have the placeholder as the first argument. And so it's bound to 10 as the second parameter. So in that particular case, of course, we're going to end up with 10 because 20 minus 10 is 10. So hopefully that'll help to clarify the difference between bind first and bind second. Until I actually sat down and you know, kind of wrote out code like this, I was always mystified about what the difference was between bind first and bind second. So that underscores yet again the importance of actually trying stuff out with STL rather than trying to derive it or divine it just from reading the manual pages or reading the documentation, which is helpful, but it's much more useful to actually look at the code and, and watch what it does.